Because of how incredible his, da his dad David was at this, he was saying David was an incredible man who knew how to war. And I'm a young kid, and I don't know the first thing about coming in for war and going out for war. Isn't it interesting that just going out was not war? But it was also the ability to come in that was a symbol of war. I want to give you modern warfare today in 2017 verbiage. Modern warfare in 2017. Coming in represents worship. This, this is modern warfare. Coming in, it represents worship. And going out in 2017 represents witnessing. It is the balance of worship and witness. The balance of my worshiping and my witness. The balance of my ability to be a witness and my ability to be a worshiper. When I learn how to come in for worship and I learn how to go out as a witness, when I operate in those two, that is when I am operating in a balance of modern warfare. Now, For almost every disciple today, we are categorically either a come-inner or a go-outer. And it has been unbelievable in the five years that I've had the privilege to pastor and plant this church. The, the, the contrast of the come-inners and the go-outers. Here's, here's the, the issue that I found with the go-outers. The go-out are only people, they struggle with fatigue and frustration. These, these are, and I know they're watching, or they're going to be listening later. This is the issue that I've seen with, without exception for years now with missionaries. They're all about the go. And so they live fatigued and exhausted and frustrated with the church all the time. Because it's, what are we doing? Why are we sitting around here all the time? We need to be going out and doing something. Good Lord, let's cast out a devil, rescue a prostitute. Let's do something, dig in somebody's toenails. Let's get something done. I don't know, it felt better. And they live fatigued and frustrated. Constantly, without saying, I have three missionaries. We have three missionaries that, that we, we deal with here at, that, that are in uh, Honduras right now. And, and, and it's unbelievable to me that every time I talk to them, every time I, I, I speak to them, or every time I check their Facebooks, or every time I roll by their Instagram, or I get the privilege of being able to sit down and have dinner or lunch with them, they are always exhausted. Because they have gotten the go right. But modern warfare is not just in your going, it is also in your coming. All these people that are called to this city and they want to they live on the streets and win them on the streets and go on the streets and it's all about the streets and, it's, and it is and it's powerful and it's unbelievable but that's not all he's, that's not the epitome, the totality of our warfare. We must also have the ability to come in, not always going out. It's unbelievable to me. The people that are go-outers, they have a joyless Jesus. They don't smile. Have you noticed? Cycle through for me, with me. I can't remember the last missionary that I saw had joy. They had a job. They had an insurmountable ability of things that they had to do. And the only time I got a smile was when I was getting their sales pitch. Because they live frustrated and fatigued. No, this is not just beat up on the go-outers. But there's also the come-inners. These are the people who are all about the church. Church. These are the worshipers. These are the people that... that I call it, they live in the glory cloud of God. Oh, I just want to be in the glory. Oh, I just want to be in the glory. Oh, I just want to be, let me tell you, let me, let me, let me tell you. You can't live there either. Here, here, here's what I've noticed about people who are all about coming in. 
the commenters. They struggle with selfishness. What program do you have for me and my kids? Why, why aren't you singing this style of music? Why, why is it too cold? Why is it too hot? Why, why isn't this done and why isn't that done? And I only want to be a part of things that are important. And by important, we mean Sunday mornings. And I only want the pastor to pray. And I only y'all ain't y'all sitting there, y'all so holy, getting on my nerves. Do you hear what I'm saying? It's all about, oh, I just, I'm not happy anymore. Here, they struggle with self. And watch this. I, I call it pseudo spirituality. They can't even pray over their food without speaking in. It's so holy. You're so holy. You better, you better pray in the Holy Ghost over that Big Mac you're putting in your clogged arteries. Everything's, you know what I'm talking about? Everything's spiritual. It, it's pseudo-spirituality. It's, it's a, listen, it's a form, but there's no power in it. They, they don't even walk. They just kind of glide <laughs> under the glory cloud of God. I just, I just want to be where the glory is. I just, I'm following the cloud. I remember hearing that over and over. I'm following the cloud. What does that mean? You following the cloud? What does that mean? You following the cloud? Here's what that means. That means as long as I feel like God is there in the way I want God to be there, I'll be there. Y'all ain't talking back to me. But the moment I feel like God is trying to challenge me to be more than in the glory... I, I, don't, I don't feel like God's going to be there anymore. This, that's, that's weird. That's, something strange is going That's strange fire. It's time for me to... I'm following the glory. Glory cloud. You understand what I'm saying? Do, do you see it? The, the go-outers and the come-inners? And this is the issue. For the go-outer, they live fatigued and frustrated. And for the come-inners, they're, they're, categorically, they're selfish and pseudo-spiritualists. -spiritual, and they're so busy shouting, they can't be a witness. You're full of the Holy Ghost, but nobody around your cubicle knows it. You're full of the Spirit of God. You've been in the glory cloud of God all this time, and you still treat your waitress the same way someone that doesn't even know God treats them? You're as rude. No, I, I'm not. Permission to speak freely? I ain't talking to y'all, I'm talking to her. <laughs> permission to speak freely? Did you shake your head now? <clears throat> she said, I'm not sure. <laughs> you'll bust up. You'll bust up. You, you're, you've been in the glory cloud of God. The fullness of the third person of the Godhead dwells among you and you are, I mean, you are just, you know, ooh, let a bow shy. I mean, you just, you know, you, ooh, ooh. But you go into the mall, into your favorite store, and you look for a moment of a tag that has been misplaced. And you'll fight everybody, including the manager, to get a discount you know you shouldn't get. But you, Come on. but but that's the issue with being only a come inner. You fight your selfishness and your pseudo spirituality. I'm blessed and highly favored. Now, I, now I, I stole that, and I call it favor. This ain't in my notes, but this is, this is, this is pretty good right here. You, you stole it, but you call it favor? Go into the restaurant, and you got that waitress that comes up to you and says, listen, I didn't charge you for your drinks. And you shouting about favor on Facebook. Meanwhile, you have allowed that waitress to steal from her company. It got quiet in this Holy Ghost filled church. And we shouting about favorite. That's the problem with only being a come inner. 
And the problem with only being a go-outer is nobody who's in the church is doing anything. I mean, it's an equal opportunity of fits today. We're getting both feet today. Nobody in the church is doing anything. Meanwhile, we funded your program. We give you an offering. We bring, but we don't do nothing. We don't do nothing. We, we take 14 people at $1,200 a piece to spend a week to do something with you, but we don't do anything. Now, that's not our people. I'm just giving you, you know, that's everybody else. Coming in and going out. Today, I feel like it's important for you to understand you're not properly equipped to go out if you don't first come in to worship. Point number one coming in to worship, it brings God's presence. Here we are in 1 Samuel 18. When I come in to worship, it brings God's presence. It brings God's presence. My worship, not my work, brings God's presence. For he inhabits the praises of Israel. It is worship that brings him in. It is not my work. Show me a man that has faith but no works, and I'll tell you his faith is dead. It's a balance. But I want you to understand the reason why we must worship is because, number one, it brings God's presence. Worship, when I come in to worship, it brings his presence. 1 Samuel 18. Now Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. Therefore Saul removed him from his presence and made him a captain over a thousand, and he went out and came in before the people. Speaking of David. Therefore, when Saul, verse 15, there, and David behaved wisely, and, and therefore when Saul saw that he had behaved, or behaved very wisely, he was afraid of him. Watch this. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. The reason why Judah and any worshiper, any praiser, and any warrior loves David is because he has the ability to be both a worshiper and a warrior. All of Judah loved this man because he wasn't just a worshiper and he wasn't just a warrior. He was both a worshiper and a warrior. He could come in to the presence of God and fit and he could go out from the presence of God and fit. And all of Judah loved him for it. The preposition is what I love the most in verse number 12. That, that the Lord was with him. When he would come in, the Lord was with him. And when he would go out, the Lord was still with him. It, it wasn't, I'm going to go in to worship and be with the Lord and then I'm going to go out and do my own thing. It was, I'm coming in for worship to be with the Lord. And when I get him here and I get him with me and I get with him, he's going to go with me into the war. God was with David. Jeremiah 17 9 through 22 says this. It says, Thus said the Lord, Go and stand before the gate of the children of people, of the people, by which the kings of Judah come in and by which they go out. Here it is again. And in all the gates of Jerusalem. And say to them, Hear the word of the Lord, you kings of Judah. And all of Judah and all of the inhabitants of Jerusalem who enter by these gates. Thus says the Lord, Take heed to yourselves and bear no burden on the Sabbath, nor bring it in. In the Hebrew saying, bring it in, go back, bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem. Same word in the Hebrew, bring in, as come in. And nor carry out the burden out of your houses by the Sabbath, nor do any work, but hallow the Sabbath as long as I have commanded your fathers. Here's what God was saying. Listen, I want you to give me one day a week where you lay everything down and you just come to me and worship. <laughs> 
One day a week, I want you to lay down all of this stuff, and I don't want you to bring me your burdens. I want you to bring me your worship. One day out of every week, I don't want you to go into your house and pick up all these burdens, but I want you to come into your house and bring me into your house, and I want you to lay everything down for one day and allow this one day to be the declaration that you have come into my presence to worship me, and you are going to be here not because of burdens, but because of me. I'm asking for one day a week. Proskuneo is the word in the Greek, which is also the, the same definition in, in, in the Hebrew, except the Hebrew word is uh, something, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Proskuneo. Here's what it means. To put your face to the ground. One day a week, I want you to literally, proskuneo, put your face to the ground. We get the word prostrate from proskuneo. I want you to come before my presence and one, at least one day a week, Put your face to the ground and bow and worship me and say, I cannot do it if you're not with me. If you're not with me, it doesn't happen. Proskuneo. I literally put your face to the ground and tell God, That if it's not you, it doesn't get done. I think literally we should do this once a week. What would happen to everything that sits under the auspice of your authority and leadership? The Garden of Eden that he has placed you in. If in the middle of your garden, once a week, Proskuneo was a part of your worship. I can't, do, I can't do this without you. I'm going crazy trying to do God's thing in man's way. There's something about bowing. As a matter of fact, when Jesus was being tempted for 40 days and 40 nights, one of the things that Satan required of him was, look, man, I'll give you, I'll give you, look at all this. I'll give you all of this, watch this, not if you'll just worship me. But he said, if you're willing to bow and worship me, I'll give you all this. If you will get proskuneo before me, Jesus, all of this stuff, it's, the three Hebrew children, My shack, your shack, and a bungalow. I heard a preacher say one time, Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro. <laughs> he said, the reason why they went through the fire was because they refused to proskuneo. Not just, we're here for you, let your spirit move. Get on your face and bow before me. I, I don't believe, here's a key. I don't believe you are equipped to go out if you haven't first come in. For how can you go do the thing for God without Him? Number two, not only does it bring in the presence, but coming into worship brings God's fear. Now, I, I saw this in a different way. I'm rereading a book by John Bevere called The Fear of the Lord. 
one of the books that I'm reading right now. And I, I saw this in a different way in light of 1 Samuel 18. He says, Now Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. Verse number 15 says, Therefore when Saul saw that he behaved very wisely, he was afraid of him. Saul at this time was the enemy of David. And because David had the presence of the Lord with him, Saul, David's enemy, was afraid of David. But he wasn't just afraid of David because of David. He was afraid of David because he recognized that David was a carrier of the presence of God through his worship. And when an enemy recognizes a warrior that is also a worshiper, there is something terrifying about a warrior who can worship and a worshiper who can war. It's one thing for you to be a worshiper. And it's one thing for you to be a warrior. But Saul, his greatest enemy, was terrified of David because he recognized that the Lord was with him. Not only was he a warrior, but he was also a worshiper. And whether he was in worship or he was engaged in war, it didn't change the fact that God was with him. The fear of the Lord was on his enemies because he was a warrior that knew how to worship that kept the presence of God. Number three, last one. Coming in to worship brings not only his presence, not only the fear of God, but number three, it brings God's wisdom. God's wisdom. Verse 14 says that David behaved wisely in all his ways and the Lord was with him. How can you not behave wisely when you recognize the Lord is with you? I, I said this a few weeks ago that 90% that of your problems would all be fixed if you recognized that the Holy Spirit was with you. All these temptations and all these struggles for failure and all these things, if we would just recognize that the Holy Spirit's with us, man, we would act so much differently. All of these things that are coming against us and all these people that are trying to hate and all these people that are trying to push, push us into failure, all of this stuff would not matter because we knew that if God was for us, who could be against us? But not only is he for me, he's also with me. So to push against me is to push against God. 90% of our problems would be fixed if we knew God was with us. He behaved wisely in all of his ways. I was at my grandmother and grandfather's house a few years ago, and I was reading through, the, they have a little book called The Promises of God. I don't know if you has ever seen one of those. It's a little book that has a bunch of verses together about all the promises of God. And every day, my grandmother and grandfather, I mean, this is all my life. We would go in on summer, uh, my mom would drop us off and my brother and I, and then uh, my little sister, when she came along, um, we would go in to, to their house before eight o'clock every single morning through the summer. Talk about the devil. I'd never get a summer off. We would come in and we couldn't say anything or do anything or even turn the TV on. We'd have to sit quietly and reverently in the living room because every single morning, that was their prayer time for my grandmother and my grandfather to pray. They were retired by that time. And we would come in before 8 o'clock every single morning through the summer into the praying and interceding of my grandfather and my grandmother. And it's a, it's a, it's a frustrating, hard thing to know you're not living fully in God's will, yet hear your name be called. It, that's, that's, that's a tough thing. All my life. Even when I was in high school and could drive, I still had to go over there before 8 o'clock because they didn't trust me to be home by myself. <laughs> That's reality. Hallelujah. We all got a story. And in that little promise book, and when, when God decides to take my grandmother, I, it's one of the things that I am going to get. Years ago, they gave the Lord 
gave them a promise over my life. It's found in Psalm 32, verse number 8. And it says this, and it was in one of their prayer times that the Holy Spirit spoke to them and said, this is Glenn. So right there in their promise book that's probably 30, 40 years old now, you open it up and it's all crinkled pages and, you know, cracked hard leather now. A promise for Glenn says it right over Psalm 32, verse 8. And it says that I will instruct you and I will show you the way to go. With my eye on you, I will counsel you. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm not a smart man. As a matter of fact, the labels message a few weeks ago, my nickname was stupid. Not even stupid. 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 I'd go through school and pretty good at math. Flunked a few of those classes. Flunked, <laughs> flunked a few of Spanish classes. My GPA, my first, my first semester of Bible college was 0 0.35. I took it to the next level the second semester. I had a 0 0.7. I was on the basketball team and I started even pass. <laughs> Never mind. Physical. It wasn't because of a lack of intelligence. It was because of a lack. It was a lack of intelligence in being disciplined. But I don't care. I, I, when someone asks me if I think I'm smart, no, I'm not smart. I've been called a smart aleck. I've been called a smart King James donkey. That's funnier in my head. Hallelujah. Y'all so holy. I don't consider myself to be a smart man. But when I put away childish things, I'm still putting some of those away. Consistently what I have heard all of my adulthood as I've begun putting childish things away is you have such wisdom. Yet you have an understanding. I'm talking about men who run multi-million dollar companies sit in front of me and go, what do you think? And then they act on what I think. Well, that's not Glenn. I'm not smart. But I believe that God held true to the promise that he gave a grandmother and a grandfather that he would give Glenn wisdom. And when I tap into his wisdom, there's something that happens. I, multi-million dollar athletes. Hey, what do you think? Women who are going through great tragedy and, and calamity in their own lives, things that I, as a man, I will never understand. Pastor, can I talk to you a little bit about, oh, pastor, yeah, that may, that's not intelligence. You know, one, one of my highlights is I got doctors in this room that have spent years in school and education in this room and watching. And watching them take notes or use things that through revelation the Holy Spirit will bring out. That's not intelligence. That's not a smart guy being smart. That's God fulfilling a promise that he gave a grandmother and a grandfather over a grandson. That he's going to guide him. And with his eye on him, he's going to counsel him wisdom. Wisdom. In studying for this message, I, I came across uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 9, the story of the Queen of Sheba. And I don't have time to really delve into it. I don't have the time, but I mean, I have the time, but you, you don't have the time. This Queen of Sheba comes in, and I'm just going to paraphrase for the sake of 
the time and she decides she's going to test Solomon. This man that God gave wisdom to. She's going to test him. So she brings in all of these riches and, and all of this stuff. And, and um, Bible scholars say that she brought in 144 ounces of gold to this conversation, which was just a small portion of her great wealth. She was considered the, the richest and wisest monarch in history leading up to Solomon, now who has superseded her because the wisdom of God set on him and then he became wise and rich because of it. So she comes to Solomon to test him. And she brings a hundred, those of you that are mathematicians, you can do the numbers. She brings 144,000 ounces of gold, time whatever gold is today. She brings it to the table to put on display just how wealthy she is. And now she's sitting down with Solomon. And she begins to test him with riddles and questions, trying to stump him to prove that she is smarter, wiser than him. 144,000 ounces of gold. All of these questions that he is not prepared for, yet the Bible says he answered all of them. And left her with no questions. There was nothing beyond the scope of Solomon's wisdom that could stump him. And verse number three says, when the queen of Sheba had seen Solomon's wisdom, what, what's the list? Those of you that are in leadership, those of you that are running companies, those of you that are, that are building businesses and organizations and ministries, what's the list? When she saw the wisdom of Solomon, the, the house that he had built, talking about the organization publicly, what, what does that public persona look like? The house that he had built, the number, verse number four, the food on his table, talking about his harvest, the seating of his servants, his leadership structure, the service of his waiters and their apparel, the uniformity and the training of his customer service reps, his cupbearer and their apparel, talking about the uniformity and the professionalism of his personal staff and his entry what his entry way by which he went up to the house of the Lord wait I get I get the structure I get the organization I get customer service I get I get your personal staff I get your social media platform and your PR but in addition to that, the way you go into the Lord's presence, notice what it says. There was no spirit left in her. In other words, she was without suspicion. Bible scholars believe that the Queen of Sheba came from the place that the wise men came from that met Jesus. I don't know if that's true. That's what they believe. But when she saw all of these things and the way he came in to worship, she said, I, I, I have no more questions to ask. Today, last verse is Ezekiel chapter number 46 where I want to leave us today. Listen to what it says. I'm going to read the whole thing. But when the Lord, the people of the land came before the Lord on the appointed feast days, whoever enters by way of the north gate to worship shall go out of the gate, the south gate. And whoever enters by way of the south gate shall go out by the way of the north. He shall not return by way of the gate through which he came, but shall go through the opposite gate. In other words, if you came in through this parking lot to worship, then you should leave through this door into this parking lot because you can't come into worship and leave the same way. If I'm going to come in through this door to worship, 
then I'm going to have to leave through that door of worship. Because for me to come in to worship means I cannot leave the same way I came. So I asked the Holy Spirit, why does it seem like that's what happens every Sunday? And here's what Holy Spirit said to me, sitting at a table off by myself this week. He said, because son, the majority of them come in to church to sing, not in to worship my presence. Do you know what this is called up here? When you have all the people up here? We, we call it the worship team. Not the song team. And this has been my challenge over and over again as I believe we are preparing to go out into the harvest to bring in the increase. Is we cannot afford for singers and players we must have worshipers but the platform is a mirror of the congregation and the congregation is a mirror of the platform and if you're just singing it must be because they're just singing and if they're just singing it must be because you're just singing but the promise of God is that if we will not enter to sing, but enter to worship, that there is no way we can come into His presence to worship and leave the same way in which we've come in. And I just want to challenge somebody in this room today. If you've been coming here and it seems like the same old, same old, the same old, same old, I go in the same way I come out. I go in the same way I come out. Maybe, just maybe, it's not the song. Maybe, just maybe, it's not the band. Maybe, just maybe, it's not the preaching. Maybe, just maybe, it's because you've come into the church, but you never worshiped into His presence. Let me, let, me, let me finish teaching for a second. I asked this at our team meeting at 915 that we have every Sunday morning. I asked this this morning. I said, when you are worshiping with the worship team, what do you think about? Where is your mind in worship? When when you hear things like way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my God that is who you are say way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my God that is who when you sing that, where, where's your mind? When, when, when I'm in worship, and I'm not telling you you have to worship like me, but you do have to worship with me. Because two people can be sitting in the same row, next to each other, the same seats, and one encounter God and the other not. Not because the, the scenery has changed, but the intent of the heart is different. When I hear things like Waymaker, I, I picture this God named Jesus who promised in Isaiah that he would go before me making the crooked path straight. So I, I see this in my mind's eye when I'm worshiping about a Waymaker. I see this big, tall grass, a grassy field that's full of thorns and thistles. And I, I see this, come here, Joshua. I see this God who stands before me. Come here 
who stands before me and is leading me and guiding me and he's pushing out all of the thorns and all of the thistles thickles and thistles and he's making this way for me I believe that he is a way maker in the midst of a storm I believe that while all the winds are thrashing around and all the things are taking place all the things are going off and all the chaos is happening in my life I believe that he's making a way and he's calming the storm of my life because he is a way maker not only a way maker but a promise keeper how many of you in this room have unclaimed promises there are promises that God has made over your life over your family's life that you have yet to see come to fruition I believe that when I'm worshiping this promise keeper and he's petitioning me that one by one he's saying my promise is yes and amen my promise is yes and amen. My promise is yes and amen. Joshua and Kathy, they were they could not have a kid. But but praise God before I walked in here. I looked at Kathy as she was holding Eden today by the power and the mercy of God. And job performance after job performance after job performance. He makes ways where he is a keeper of promises. Not only is he a keeper of promises, but he's a miracle worker. And in my mind's eye, when we say things like miracle worker, my expectation is for people to lift up out of wheelchairs. My expectation is for people to throw crutches away. My expectation is for people who are about to lose their mind all of a sudden get right in their mind's eye. My expectation is for those who cannot afford to even pay their next bill as a bill, a check in the mail because of God's provision in their life. I want Him to perform miracles where we become trophies of grace again. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask. I think, do you hear what I, And I am persuaded that He's able to keep us being committed to Him even against that day. I take all of that. Thanks, Josh. I take all of that. And I put this God seated on a throne. And I have the ability to boldly approach the throne of grace. The one who makes ways where there seem to be no ways. The ones who keeps promises. Every other man can be a liar, but God has to be true. The one who was able to make miracles take place. I seat him on a throne. And in my mind's eye, and in my spirit, proskuneo takes place. Proskuneo takes place. And there are times when I feel like the Holy Spirit wants me to get proskuneo in the middle of worship. And do you know what goes through my mind when proskuneo happens? Hey, your underwear's showing. the enemy will say anything to keep me from bowing to him in worship today I, I don't I don't know and I'm not going to assume but before we leave this place I want you to worship the Lord because I believe if you worship the Lord you can't leave the same way you came in may feel like the south end but you'll leave the north and you may feel like you're at the north end but you'll leave by way of the south because when we worship we have to leave differently today I'm inviting every single person under the sound of my voice to position yourself for worship come on all over this room I don't care if it's on your knees. I don't care if you need to be proscenio. I don't care if you need to stand. I don't care if you need to pace. 
but all over this room. Come on, I want everybody to stand initially for me. Come on, if you're physically able. I'm going to get you moving. I'm going to get you moving.